Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. The Flat Earth Theory is being propagated by people influenced by Robert Sungenis, apparently by Robert Sungenis. I was meant to debate Robert Sungenis a number of years ago, but the debate plans broke down and he withdrew rather angrily. We simply wanted him to obtain on a letterhead anything confirming that he was authorized to speak as an apologist for the Roman Catholic Church. We stated it could have come from, obviously from the Vatican, or from any Roman Catholic diocese, or it could have come from any Roman Catholic religious order. We simply needed something official to state that he was authorized to speak on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church institutionally. He did not provide it. Apparently, he cannot provide it. No Roman Catholic diocese, much less the Vatican, or any religious order, is prepared to give him a credential or an acknowledgement that he is an authorized spokesman for the Roman Catholic Church theologically. Many Catholics that we've talked to and other people consider him, among other things, to be a anti-Semite, to be anti-Semitic. It's his followers who appear to be propagating this flat earth doctrine. They don't even call it a theory, but it's, a, it's, it's dogma to them. And some very ignorant, some extremely ignorant evangelical Christians or born-again Christians are buying into it and being influenced by it in their ignorance. The first thing we should point out is this, that Robert Sungenis is not authorized to speak on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. Yet, he defends it or attempts to defend it vociferously. That is his attempt. Secondly, we have to point out that although there are concerted efforts to make it resemble the Darwinist debate, it has nothing whatsoever to do with Darwinism versus creation. Darwinism is bad science resulting in an attack on the historicity of the Word of God and its theology. Those who attempt to unite Darwinism with the biblical creation account wind up with bad doctrine, something in the area of theistic evolution or some other doctrinal error. So Darwinism is bad science that attacks the historicity of Scripture, and when someone tries to accommodate Darwinism, Within Christian thought, you wind up with wrong doctrines such as theistic evolution. Flat Earth is nothing like that. It is not bad science. It is simply science. Secondly, it in no sense attacks any biblical record or historicity or doctrine. Thirdly, any attempt to unite Flat Earth with biblical dogma is of no consequence whatsoever. It's not like the Darwinism debate. There's no equivalence between the two. Now let's go even further with this. I've explained before the following. What these people are saying is, the scripture says the earth is flat and we must believe it. We shouldn't believe satellite photographs. <laughs> We shouldn't believe 
any scientific evidence. We should simply believe what the Word of God says or we're lacking faith. And those who say the world is spherical are suffering from a lack of faith. This is craziness. No place does the Scripture present itself as being indicative of the earth being spherical or simply circular in the sense of a flat plane. It's speaking not about cosmology, astronomy, or astrophysics. It is speaking about doctrine. Let's begin by looking at the issue of literary genre. We've pointed out a number of times that God uses different literary genre in his word to explain different kinds of truths. Hebrew poetry or the Psalms, apocalyptic is Zechariah, Daniel, Revelation. We have biography in the book of Kings. We have narrative in the Gospels. God uses different literature to communicate different kinds of truths. We would not read instructions of how to operate a microwave oven or an electrical appliance the same way we would read a Shakespearean sonnet. You approach different kinds of literature with different presuppositions. So it is with Scripture. What some people do is they try to take Scripture and use it as a form of literature. It is not claiming it is stating things that it does not. Let's look at some examples of this. One situation I was involved in that had very terrible ramifications and repercussions in, in Vietnam was the late Howard Camping. That man was deranged. He had no theological background of any kind whatsoever. He was by training and education an engineer. So what he did was he studied scripture as a mathematics book. He studied prophecy from the perspective of mathematics. That's what he did. Now, there is mathematical content in Scripture, but it is not a math book. He wound up doing things that Scripture and Jesus himself said, don't do. We do not know the day or the hour of his return. Yet, that is exactly what Harold Camping did, and when he got it wrong, he reset the date. He engaged in a ridiculous kind of practice that had happened before with the ancient Millerites, with Jehovah's Witnesses and others, cognitive dissonance. Oh, we got the date wrong. And because people made such a commitment to believing the nonsense he was saying, they just kept going along with it. You don't read scripture as a math book, even though it has mathematical content. Another person who was a false teacher and who has led the church into much error and compromise on moral issues, such as homosexuality is Tony Campolo and his son Bart. Tony Campolo, again, has no theological background. He's a sociologist. A major part of that man's problem, a major part of his problem that Satan uses to deceive people through him is that he reads the scriptures as if it were a sociology book or a sociological treaty. Now, the same as the scripture has mathematical content, it also has sociological content, anthropological content. That is true. But it's not a sociology book any more than it's a math book. It's a theology book. Well, let's go further. I know people who treat Scripture, misuse Scripture, as if it is a textbook of Greek, at least the New Testament. I once read the opinion of a commentator who was a rather good Greek scholar in terms of his technical knowledge of Greek language, grammar, and syntax. But simply because he read the scripture as a Greek book, his idea of exegesis was just get the grammar and syntax right, and that will give you the exegesis. There's more to exegesis than grammar and syntax, even though grammar and syntax are certainly important. He wound up concluding that the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 was not the Holy Spirit or an angel or whatever. He wound up saying that the restrainer was or is 
Satan. This is completely crazy. But because he could make the Greek grammar work, that's what he arrived at. He read it as a literary treatise of the Greek language, but not as doctrinal theology. Whenever you read scripture on a wrong presupposition, misunderstanding what it is and making it something it isn't, you're heading for trouble. When you have the genre wrong, the approach wrong, the mindset wrong, as Harold Camping, as Tony Campola and others have done, you're going to get yourself in trouble. It has philosophical content, but it's not primarily a philosophy book. Well, likewise, Scripture has historical content, but the history of Scripture is largely narrative. Genesis 1 to 11 the creation and the flood, etc., is a narrative. Same as the Gospels. Well, we're told in John's Gospel that of all the miracles and deeds that Jesus did were written down, all the books couldn't contain it. A narrative is a true story. It is a story that has historicity. That's what it is. A story that has historicity. But let's continue with this. It's a true story. But it's not written to be a history. The Gospels, although they are historically true, although they have historicity, although they are factual accounts, are not written to teach us the history of Jesus. They are rather the theological interpretation of the history of Jesus. Later, there be Gnostic Gospels who have wrong accounts of the history and who misinterpret the history and teaching of Jesus. It's the theological interpretation of the story of Jesus. That's what the Gospels are. They're narratives. Genesis 1 to 11 is the same. It has historicity. It is historically true as a story. It's a true story. But it's not written as the history of the creation. In fact, the book of Job, verse for verse, says more about the creation than Genesis does. Rather, Genesis 1 to 11 is the theological interpretation of the history of the creation. It's historically true in what it says, but it's not written to teach us the history. It's written to teach us the theological interpretation of that history, even though the historical content is true. The Pentateuch, the books of Moses, open with the creation narrative and the flood narrative, the Diluvian narrative in Genesis 1 to 11. They are, in its own sense of neighbor, in its own cultural context and setting, in large measure, a polemic against the pagan epics of the same events. The ancient Egyptians had flood narratives. The ancient Egyptians had an Adam and Eve type story. If we read the Epic of Gilgamesh, other civilizations in the ancient Near East knew about the saga of Noah. Other people knew these things. However, because of monotheism and divine revelation through Moses, the Hebrews, the Israelites, had the historically correct record and the theologically correct interpretation of the record against these pagan narratives telling the same story from a pagan disposition. The most historically accurate record of these events is what's in the Torah of the Jews that God gave Moses, but more importantly is the theological interpretation of them being monotheistic. When you try to make Genesis 1 to 11 a textbook of the creation or a textbook of creation science, you're misreading it. It was not written to be that. We're told in Job, we don't know how God made these things. It's the theological interpretation of the history of the creation. 
Now, what flat earth does is misreads it completely. It makes these things something other than what they were. The ancient Hebrews were like all of the other ancient civilizations of the ancient world. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, all the way forward to the Greeks and Romans, they were observationists. They didn't understand cosmology in the sense that we do. They didn't have notions of astrophysics as we do. They didn't understand astronomy as we do. To them, in the pagan world, astronomy and astrology were mixed. Additionally, geometry, as pioneered by Euclid and by Archimedes, was concerned with the measurements of the Earth or of plane surfaces. Geo, the Greek word for Earth. There was no cosmological application or astronomical application of mathematics until a much later point. In fact, it was really Johannes Kepler, thousands of years later, who began using elliptical geometry to explain solar systems and things like this. It was thousands of years later. The Hebrews were like all the other civilizations. They were mere observationists. And so you take these verses that speak about something circumferential. The text is not trying to say if it is a plane surface with a circumference and a radius, or if it's something spherical. It's not trying to make a statement about either one. It's trying to make a theological statement simply using something to do with 360 degrees to explain it. When we look at passages such as Proverbs 8, Proverbs 8, its main purpose is to show Jesus in the creation in the Old Testament. It's to link the creation narrative of Genesis with John chapter 1. The world was made through him. That's Jesus in Proverbs 8. That's its main purpose. It's there to make a theological statement about Christ and the creation. It's not there to teach cosmology or astronomy. Isaiah 40, 22, he who sits upon the circle of the earth. That can be understood as a, as a flat plane with something circumferential made with a compass from the original Hebrew, and you're at the radius point. It's simply talking about the horizon visible within that 360 degrees from the radius. That's all it's saying. Whether or not it is simply that, or if it's implying something spherical, it's not trying to imply either one. It's not trying to make a scientific or a mathematical statement. Likewise, when we look at the book of Job, chapter uh, 26, verse 7, it's the same. It's not trying to make a cosmological or an astronomical statement. It's trying to make a theological statement. Some of the flat earth people have actually proposed that the earth is on pillars because there's a verse that says that. But in Job 26, 7, God hangs the earth on nothing. <laughs> Supported by satellite photography. We have other passages that could be interpreted to support a round earth that was not simply circumferential, but spherical. For instance, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, or the comments of Jesus concerning Jonah in Matthew 12, 40, would suggest that the earth has depth. It's not purely flat, but there's some depth to it. Or Luke 17, 34, when the Lord comes, some will be sleeping, some will be working. Well, that would seem to support a spherical earth because the rotation on the earth on its axis, night and day. But the fact is, none of those passages are trying to teach anything about the earth being spherical or flat. They're trying to make theological statements. Whether the circumferential 
analogy is of a radius on a flat plane or something spherical, that's not what it's about. But people try to make it about that. Now, why did the followers of Mr. Sengenis engage in this folly? When well, we have satellite photographs showing the Earth is round, and the suggestion that it was the ancient pagans who believed in a spherical Earth because they rejected the Word of God, this is absolutely crazy. People believed that the Earth was spherical because the other heavenly bodies that they could see, such as the moon and the sun, were spherical. That's why they determined it was spherical, because the other heavenly bodies they could see were spherical. They couldn't see all the planets, but they could see some of them because they didn't twinkle, so they knew they were in stars, and they seemed to be round. It had nothing whatsoever to do with rejecting the scripture. It had to do with common sense and putting two and two together. So what is the motive for these followers of Mr. Sengenis to promote this nonsense? And don't ask me to explain why any born-again Christian would pay it any mind. Again, he's out to defend medieval Roman Catholicism. The Roman Catholic Church to this day remains very sensitive to the fact that it condemned modern science and its founders. They identified Christianity with the old Ptolemaic worldview that went back to the ancient Greeks. When Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler came along, the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated them as heretics for the sin of being right. This is a source of embarrassment for the Roman Catholic Church. Why did you excommunicate people like Copernicus, the brilliant Polish astronomer theoretician? Why, why did you do these things to the people who agree with Galileo and so forth? Um, it's very difficult for them to defend it, but defend it they must try to. Remember, in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle writes, our faith is reasonable. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, God wanting to reason with man about our sins, certainly, but God is reasonable, and he gave us a mind capable of reasoning, and he wants us to reason. What false religion does is suspend critical faculty. Don't reason. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Our faith is reasonable, says Paul. But that does not mean that our faith is intellectual. But it does mean, as I pointed out, our faith is intellectually credible. The Judeo-Christian faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an intellectual faith. It comes from Revelation. But it is intellectually defensible, intellectually credible. It has empirical evidence to believe it, as opposed to other religions people invented. We have cause and effect. But the Dalai Lama, a Tibetan Buddhist, says he doesn't believe as a creator. He says we can still be one, however, with Christians and Jews by closing our eyes together and meditating about things like peace. <laughs> but he doesn't believe as a creator. Islam explains cosmology and astronomy the following way. The sun becomes tired at night and descends into a miry, muddy pit, and then wakes up again the next morning. That's actually the teaching of Islam. That's in their holy book. <laughs> it's not reasonable to believe that. But it is reasonable to believe Job 26, 7, the Lord hangs the earth on nothing. Our faith is reasonable. Roman Catholicism, however, is not reasonable. They subscribe to the Aristotelian philosophy of accidents. It looks like wine, it tastes like wine, it smells like wine, but it's not wine. It's the protoplasmic blood, hemoglobin of Jesus Christ. It was transubstantiated. The wine is its mere accidents or appearances. 
It looks like bread, it tastes like bread, and has the chemical constituency of bread, but it's not bread. It's the protoplasmic flesh of Jesus Christ. It was transubstantiated. It's not reasonable to believe that. That was based on the disproven and debunked physics and chemistry of Aristotle before people understood about the nature of electron transmission between the orbits of different atoms. They didn't understand chemical change. They thought you have chlorine and sodium, and you put them together, and it's sodium chloride. They thought it was still chlorine and sodium. They didn't know it had become table salt through chemical change because they didn't understand it. Remember, until the Enlightenment, astron uh, astronomy and astrology were the same. So too, magic and chemistry were the same. They called it alchemy. Well, the Roman Catholic Church is based on alchemy, something that's disproven. We know these chemical changes take place. It's not a different substance that still has the appearances or accidents of something else. It writes like a pen, it looks like a pen, goes in my pocket like a pen, but it's not a pen, it's a cigar. Give me a light, Jack. That's what transubstantiation is based on. Something that's debunked. Well, flat earth comes from the same medieval Roman Catholic way of thinking. We're expected to believe things that are unreasonable and unscientific, as you do in Islam. Mormonism is another example. We're expected to believe things that are absurd. In the Book of Mormon, we read absurd things. Nobody can believe that North American Indians are ancient Semites from the Middle East. Their mitochondrial DNA proves that they're the descendants of Siberians who came across the Aleutian Islands from Siberia to Alaska and down into the Americas, as the anthropologists always believe. Mitochondrial DNA proves it. But the Book of Mormon says no. God changed the DNA of American Indians to test the faith of Mormons, some of them say. It's absurd. It's not reasonable to believe in Mormonism or Roman Catholicism or Islam. But Roman Catholicism demands this belief because it cannot change its basic doctrines known as de fide doctrines. Roman Catholicism has two kinds of doctrine, proxima fede and de fede. A proxima fede doctrine like changing the mass from Latin to English, they can do that. But a de fede doctrine like transubstantiation, they can't change it. Their constitutional motto is sempre eden, always the same. So they've got a problem. How do we defend this? It became so absurd that Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, began using visualization exercises copied from Eastern religious meditative techniques. Today, it's New Age. We call it New Age. But it's the same idea of visualization. You go through these visualization exercises that were designed to brainwash people into believing things that weren't logical. This was the Jesuits. To the point where Ignatius Loyola said, if Holy Mother the Church, meaning the Pope, says it is daylight out, but it's actually dark, we must believe it is daylight. You suspend critical faculty. You throw reason out the window. Well, if the satellite photograph shows the Earth is round, you suspend critical faculty. You throw, you throw your logic out the window if you believe in a spherical Earth. These things are not known. And they're not peculiar to Christendom. Roman Catholicism is largely built on such rubbish, as is Mormonism as is Islam. But let's go even further with it. Unfortunately, some evangelicals bought into it. The followers of the money preachers, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, my body's lying to me, I don't have a fever, my body's lying. You suspend critical faculties and you believe things that are not reasonable. Now they got this from Christian science, from Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of this cult that was neither Christian nor scientific. What you see in Roman Catholicism 
is what you see in the word faith preachers, it's what you see in the Christian science cult, it's what you see in Islam, it's what you see in Mormonism. You suspend critical faculties and believe something that's crazy. That's what flat earth is. You suspend critical faculties and believe something that's crazy. None of those verses or passages that they're citing, be it Proverbs 8, Isaiah 40, 12, none of them are trying to teach cosmology or astronomy or astrophysics. They're trying to teach theology, doctrinal theology, that's all. Even Roman Catholics know that Robert Sugenis does not play with a full deck. These are ignorant people. But Paul says to Christians, to saved Christians, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. <laughs> it is only a very ignorant, born-again Christian that would devote any more than two seconds of their time to considering something so silly and so ridiculous as flat earth. It is not like Darwinism. Darwinism is bad science. Spherical earth is simply science. Darwinism causes people to doubt the historicity of Scripture based on bad science. Flat Earth well, <laughs> is nothing like that. It's a complete nonsense, a total nonsense. No believer should pay it any mind whatsoever. Now, I leave you with one other thing. There was one other difference that the ancient Israelites had concerning these celestial bodies from the pagan world. The pagan world deified these planets or said that they were the habitation of certain gods, like Apollo, the moon god. The Romans identified who the Greeks called Jupiter uh, the Greeks called Zeus, sorry, with the planet Jupiter. The Israelites knew from the scriptures that these heavenly bodies were created entities. They were not gods. They were not to be deified. They were created entities. They understood that there was a typological or a symbolic meaning to these things. For instance, Abraham's children are compared to the stars of heaven. There's a symbolic meaning to these things, doctrinally and theologically, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. But it's not like Greek mythology or Babylonian superstition, where you actually see these planets as gods or the inhabited space or home of gods. This is crazy. That was a difference. Christians and Jews were to look to the Creator, not the created. They didn't deify planets or things like this as the other ancients did. That was the difference. But that's the only difference. Please, don't waste your time. Pay no attention to this kind of ridiculous foolishness. You can go on the internet and see for yourself on the NASA website photographs of Earth taken from outer space. It is spherically round, and there is nothing in Scripture that contradicts that. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.